You're listening to the Second Mass Report, the Falling Skies podcast. This episode covers Season 5, Episode 4, and I believe it's called Dark and Compelling. Uh, oh, wait, no. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Pope Breaks Bad. Oh, I thought it was called Pope on a Rope. Uh, the Pope Smokes Dope is what it is. Uh, apparently, if you've seen the ending. Um, and hence, we have our Breaking Bad moment. <laughs> oh, yes. So, uh, hey, do you think that this episode's title references the show Breaking Bad, or is it just using the phrase innocuously? I think it's using the phrase innocuously. Okay. Not really innocuously. It's, uh, oh, can you tell it's late? I'm slurring here. Uh, He he breaks pretty bad. Yes, he does. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I'm tired, too. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. (laughs) Uh-oh. Okay, here. Hey, disclaimer here's time? Di- yeah, here's some more disclaimers for you. If you listen to the previous podcast, we're actually recording it on the same night. So it's later and. Um, we took a little break weirder. for Frank to watch it. Yeah, it's weirder. It's later. Uh, disclaimers are abounding, and I don't know what's going on. So, um, yeah, so it's nice. Um, so here's the thing about this episode I was sensing just ironies everywhere up and down the halls up and down the walls it especially going back to like season one if you analyze all the characters from season one and pair them with an analysis of their of just really them and their state states of mind sure of season five almost you'll see so many polar opposites um, honestly, the people who are like the least opposite are pretty much just like, uh, Weaver, Matt, uh, that might be about it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, wow. Because you look at, and, and some people are like, maybe not opposite, but maybe more like, I wouldn't say Anne is opposite. Uh, um, she was actually more opposite last season when she was all, uh, right. But like, this season, more, I think she's been very much and again. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, I can see that. I'll, and here, about Pope, uh, he's kind of, he's uh, kind of always been Pope, but he's like Pope on steroids now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's so much more personal. Um, like, we met, you know, we've seen kind of selfish hoodlum Pope before, uh, really since day one, but this is so much more personal to him. This isn't just, oh, I... Uh, I'm smarter than you, so I'm going to boss you around, or I'm I'm just going to set up, you know, my own little lair here, and, you know, I'm just going to kind of live it up, whatever. I mean, this is very, I mean, he's, he's, he's being, he's being a little terrorist right now. Uh, Uh, yes. And, and in one sense, I kind of get his arguments. Like, when he's actually arguing, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I mean, that's a great point. That's a great question. And then he gets countered with great points and great questions. So I want to jump into comparing some things from season one and season five now. Um, Pope and Tom had quite the showdown. And when when Tom said, just get out of here, pack your bags, yeah, go right. by tomorrow. Uh, there was an interesting moment in there where Tom, uh, uh, Pope challenges him and says, if that was one of your boys... You think you would have just uh, you know, oh, yeah. swung, swung back around at the end? And I say, that's a great question. And yeah, that, and you know what? Good... He couldn't answer that. I mean, he did answer it, but man, uh, Pope's right. Pope is right, but at the time, rewind to season one, I think pretty much the first episode where Hal wanted to go get Ben right away. Remember when Ben was harnessed? Yes. I think going back to episode one, and and Tom says, no, that is a poor move right now. We need to stick to our plan. We'll go back and get him later. It wasn't until several episodes later that they went and got Ben. So it's very interesting that this whole conversation is coming up when you can go back to episode one and say, well, wait a minute. Back in the day, Tom actually did wait till later. Interesting. I forgot about that. Yeah, no, I was I was recalling tons of stuff from season one tonight. It was crazy, but that's one of the things. So I, and it's funny that that didn't get brought into the conversation of the script in the episode. But in my mind, I'm going, maybe that might kind of deserve a mention. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, 
where are you with the way Pope is acting and Tom's reaction to him? I could 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 Tom be handling things better? Uh, does, is yeah, Pope, definitely. Is, is is any of Pope's actions warranted? Are they? That's kind of what I want to know. Oh, man, you know, this is one of those things where when you start talking about what's happening here, it comes down to, and, and this is actually a sign of a really good show. Uh, with really good shows, in my opinion, when you start getting into character motivation and, and where a character is coming from, you, you get into the ethics of the character, you get into their viewpoint, and it, it, it rounds them out. In this case, uh it comes down to, to viewpoint for these two. Is Pope wrong for how he's reacting? Well, the, his actual reaction may be uh, over the top, as we see at the end. But I think he's just in the beginning when he's questioning Tom and when he's saying, hey, look, you're out of control. You wouldn't have sacrificed your family to this degree. And that's actually where I think you know, the, the thing you pointed out might be wrong. I don't think, now that he's got his family around him, we saw how how hard he fought for Lexi. How hard would he fight for his boys? He, I don't think he would let them die out in the woods. But I think that, that from Tom's standpoint, what he said is accurate. I would not have let them die in the woods, but I would have not taken our only vehicle. I would have dealt with it myself. Okay. So now, I do think now, that, that you've got two opposing viewpoints, and I think that they're both being honest with each other. Now, it's interesting that you bring up Lexi because, yes, Tom did fight hard for Lexi. However, he also consented to her self-sacrifice, right? True. So there's so many there's so many things that this conversation, it's, and it's interesting to see how Pope and uh, Tom are coming to a head here when they've both have they both have really good points to make and i can both i can relate to kind of both of them and see where they're both coming from so it's very interesting i think some of pope's actions i think certainly a lot of his thoughts are warranted i don't see uh i don't approve or condone of his you know kind of terrorism here threatening yeah. people's lives threatening to hurt you know people that didn't have anything to do with it to get back at tom yeah yeah um, no no this is where he's getting out of control He's getting out of control, but when he I'm just going his, by what he said, what his he, standpoint is. Right, right, right. When he makes his arguments, I go, that's a great point and something that I think needs uh, to be dealt with interpersonally. And Tom hasn't been perfect either. We pointed that out in the previous podcast. He's We're starting to see some unravelings here of how his uh, whole war obsession and, and rage uh, uh, perspective now are kind of uh, maybe costing some lives, maybe costing uh, uh, maybe, some relationships. Yes. yes. So, um, so yeah, uh, it's very it's very interesting dynamic. I think it's I'm really looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Now, this episode that we watched was highly interpersonal compared to the previous episode. Uh, the the um, um, what was it called? Not skitters, not inklings. Uh, hatchlings. Hatchlings. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where I mean, there was a lot going on. You know, good versus evil. Uh, you know, human versus alien in um that episode. Really, there wasn't a whole lot of fight scenes, battle scenes, enemy scenes. Uh, there was you know the death with the bugs and the bug scene. But other than that, this was a very interpersonal episode. This was this episode was almost all drama. Yeah, uh, no kidding. And the ending, you know, just like on the last one, it, it the whole time there was all this story going on, character development. I actually think this was a better episode than the last one. I, the, I think it it was a little less exciting, but definitely a better better episode, better written, better made episode. When, when we and, got to the end, and I think this might be what we see over the next few episodes. The ending was the big push when it when Anne went in there with Pope, uh, when when Anthony like tricked her into going in there. I mean, this was big, big stuff. And when I, as soon as she brought, as soon as that conversation with Anthony began, I said to myself, "This is a trap." <laughs> and don't yeah. you trust this for a minute? This is a trap. 
And I'm kind of wondering what the point of that conversation was. Like, how did that start? Did did Pope say to Anthony, all right, Anthony, uh, so since we're pals now, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go out and find Anne and bring her to me, and I'm going to scare her. Like, I, like, what was the point of that? I, like, what yeah, was yeah. what was the initial uh, uh, goal in mind to when when that transpired? Like, I feel like that was a little... It felt just kind of messy and erratic. Like, I'm just pissed, and I want to, like, express myself to Anne and just freak her out, you know? Like, it just seemed kind of weird. Yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got for you on that one. Okay. Well, how about this? Here's here's another. Uh, you can tell it's late. Like I, I've already thought this out so much too that I think that I've I've talked to myself through this one. And now that I'm saying your exact thoughts, you're just like, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, here's here's something I want to bring up, and another very interesting dynamic gone reverse from season one. You saw Anthony and Pope for the first time form uh, something of an alliance. Um, they, they've kind of gotten along, they've fought side by side in recent seasons, but if you think back to season one, Anthony uh, could not stand Pope. He was just like, and, and that's back when Anthony was still kind of this like... Well, he was, he was military. Uh, he was police, actually. Yes, yes, but he was more, he was more authoritative, like he was in that right. he world, was and very, Pope is the opposite of that. Yeah, Anthony was very, uh, you know rules and by the book and very compassionate but he was he was very police like if you will he was yes. like the ideal police officer of the second mass even though he didn't you know wasn't like making arrests or anything he just had like a good like you know service the Barney and- Fife of uh of the second mass well not exactly but i get what you mean um <laughs> and and he uh you know had zero tolerance for pope um he would. He wouldn't even call him John or Pope. He would call him convict. Remember that season one? Oh yeah. What you, ta- what you talking about, convict? Yeah. I mean, yep. he just. And I remember. He, nice he, impression, he, by the way. Thank you. I'm very impressionable. Um, so oh. Ant had this <laughs> very dis. He had this Pope distaste, and uh, I have a distaste now too. Uh, you know what, Rob? You volunteered for this. Um, <laughs> so here, here's the thing, uh, Anthony. Having his that that distaste for Pope, there was a specific conversation, and I want to say it was episode three, maybe, um, maybe two, maybe four, somewhere in there, early on in season one. Anthony said something to Pope about when this war is over, like I'm going to arrest you myself, or he said something like that. Right. And uh, it's very interesting to see, wh- you know, my how the turntables, you know, here in season five. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's... it's it's it was. I found it actually kind of shocking comparatively that uh, that we saw Anthony with Pope after everything we've seen forming that alliance. But I think that that Anthony is no longer Anthony. I mean, he seems to have gone over the deep end, and right. I don't think he's coming back. <laughs> but I, is anybody, did I call anybody... it on the last one? I think he's going to die before this is over. But is anybody anybody? I mean, is is Hal still Hal? Is Maggie still Maggie? Is is Pope still Pope? Is I mean, a lot of people have changed so much from your first season. Uh, you know, they've been harnessed or they've been, you know, people have died and people have changed. And, and uh, I mean, so much is going on that, like, if you just draw, you know, back to season one, it's just like, man, these dots are almost hard to connect. But yeah. at the same time, yeah, I mean, after after going through that, I love the line by um, Weaver, who I think has had a relatively steady hand throughout the entire series, other than maybe in season one he went through that experience with the, you know taking the pills and, and becoming a, a better leader. Other than that, he's had a relatively steady hand throughout this entire series. And he said something to Tom about war can be like a drug. And uh, I wish I could complete the line, but it was... It, it, it's almost as though Weaver's been like everybody's counselor lately. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to see, um, just the way a lot of people and a lot of relationships are kind of spiraling out of control, given the circumstances and surroundings and just the imminent threats and just the deaths and the heartbreaks and just everything going on. It's very interesting chemistry. I, I kind of just, these last two episodes, I kind of didn't see all this coming, but it's, 
it's gotten really dicey interpersonally. Yeah, right. <sighs> so, um, so you say something now. I mean, <laughs> come on. this isn't all about me. Well, no, Frank. I'm, you know, the last one, uh, I had a lot to say. Um, I st- think I'm still processing a lot of went on here. What went on here? You know, what? let's do this. Let's get to the ending. Let's get to what happened at the end, and then we can kind of backtrack because I think that's where I'm getting uh, held up here. Yeah. Um, up. Hey, so Anthony, let, I'm gonna set the stage here a little bit. Anthony uh, tricks Anne basically, okay. and and we knew, like you said, we knew this was a setup. Yeah, and yeah. and the fact that she didn't is amazing to me because, <laughs> frankly, uh he was he was broadcasting it. You know what I mean? I mean, he made it very obvious, like, oh, yeah, no, this is where I'm hanging out. Yeah, no, we need to go someplace private to talk. It was like, wow. I mean, the fact that she didn't see that it, it is troublesome. Anne was setting herself up to be a victim. And honestly, that conversation, I think, should have taken place. If you're Anne, go like, I'm glad to hear you say that. Let's get Weaver and Tom. Right. Let's sit down and talk. But no, she was totally vulnerable and seemed to be oblivious to the fact that she was in danger. Yeah. He takes her into this thing. It looks like they've, they've been hoarding. You know, it's like hoarders buried alive. Yeah, how did they Falling build that little... Edition. How'd they build that little fort so with, fast? With all the weird stuff in there. Yeah, well, it might be the, the kind of rat hole that either Pope has been living in or Anthony's been living in. Yeah. I don't think it was fast. I think it may have been there already. We've uh, seen uh, we've seen Pope do that before. Didn't he have like a TV or something? Yes, yes. So this could be what that was. Then we get the reveal that Pope has shaved his head. Okay, and I want to address that. What do you make of his shaved head? What do you make of his his change in appearance? Is that is there literary uh, depth to that? I uh, wow. Well, the first thing I thought of was uh, was uh, Ed Norton in American History X, where he's gone off the deep end, he's become a skinhead Nazi. I think that's what we were seeing. Not that he became a skinhead Nazi, but the, the, the shaving the head represents his transformation. And, of course, you're referencing something I have no clue what you're talking about. You don't know what that is, Really? There, I know Ed, it's, it's I know all about Ed, Ed Norton when I know, he, he's a skinhead, and it's it's a pretty brutal movie, but it's fantastic. I know Ed Norton from The Honeymooners. Yeah, uh, <laughs> come on, you got to know who Edward Norton is. No, he played the Hulk in the first one. There you go. But I don't know anything about a skinhead Nazi zombie. Really? Not zombie. Not zombie. <laughs> you should definitely check it out. Yes. You should, oh, you're the worst. You should definitely <laughs> check it out. Uh, it, right, well, what it's is a it really called? great It's called American History X in the never ending okay. list of things Frank needs to check out. Yeah, you, we should make a blog about things I need to. Well, things everyone needs to see that you never heard of by Rob Southgate. <laughs> that's why I have a network. Okay, yeah, so that's I, fair. That's I just argument. spit these things out, and everyone's like, really? How did you have time to watch all this stuff? I, I don't know. All right, back to Falling Skies and yes. back to everything that we're talking about. Um, Shaving his head, okay? Now, as we're talking about this, I've seen people do that before in TV shows when it's supposed to signify, you know... Yeah, it's, a, at, it's the transformation. It's, it's a the, transformation. but it's The it rebirth of the character. It he typically a, signifies coming out of some kind of trauma, I think. You know what? <laughs> or Once again, it's, it's a direct reflection of Breaking Bad because Walt shaved his head. Now, he shaved his head because of cancer. Partly. Right. But that was when he became the Heisenberg. The Heisenberg, yes. Yes, but okay, and that's but, what Pope just did here. He well, became and, Heisenberg. So, so we're attributing literary significance to the shaving of the head. Yes, absolutely. It's not just. It's not just. Oh, I have cancer, so I'm gonna shave my head. There was there was literary significance to that in this telling of the story, just as there is with Pope, right? Absolutely. Okay, now let, let me bring up a couple other things. We saw Shane do that in Walking Dead. Yeah. We saw John at, at Connor, his breakdown point. We saw John Connor do that in I want to say it was episode one of season two of Sarah Connor Chronicles. Oh, I don't remember that. You Have got you, me, Frank. I did watch it. 
You okay? I was about to say, is there something I've seen that you haven't? Because no, that, no, no. I watched that whole series. It was great. Okay, I I freaking love that series, and Fox can burn in hell for canceling it. A friend of um, mine played a Terminator in that. What? Remember the one with the Terminator that was in the bank, like behind the wall? It was a Terminator that had been there since like the 30s. Yes, that's my friend Todd. What? Yep. <laughs> You need to introduce me to him, and then we need him and I need to do a Sarah Connor Chronicles podcast. <laughs> well, good luck. He's a busy guy. He's in. I don't he's care. in so much stuff. I'm a busy guy. Yeah, they interviewed well, him we'll on see before if, the bat we'll, because we'll he was see on, if I have time for him. He was on Gotham this year, so they he, they uh, interviewed him on before the bat. Okay, well, he's your friend, so he can't be that busy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Wait a minute! You're my friend. Shot Dude, to yourself. Uh, Bam! Oh, the the brutality is layered right now. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh! It's almost midnight. All right. Um. So shaving your head—that means something. We've just found that out. Anyway, continue. <laughs> no. Okay. I uh, I forgot where we were. We were with Anthony. Pope oh yeah, yeah, Anthony. yeah. So. Once again, this was strange, too. Anne says to Pope, so you're going to get your revenge by killing me. Because now, it, is, it, that, it, is that what Pope had in mind? Like, no. Because, because he was holding a knife over, like in her direction, and so she inferred from that, okay, you're going to kill me? And then Pope goes, oh, that's an interesting idea. It, it didn't ever seem like he ever had the intention of killing her. Anne was the one who brought that up. Well, he, okay, so here's what I wonder about that. Because here, what we saw later is he took Hal and right. had his plan. I'm going to kill you in front of your dad, and then I'm going to kill him. And let me just ask you this. In, in Pope's mind, I think part of him is serious about what he's saying, but I think somewhere in the back of his mind, he's going, I'm not really going to kill anybody. I really am not going to kill anybody. If he's gone off the deep end, he's going to kill. And I don't, and it's not that he's not capable, but I think somewhere in the back of his mind, he's going, I just want to put on a show. I just want to freak people out. I just want some attention. And that could be the the shaving head and all of that. You could be right. I, because I think, and just to, I don't know, just to get dark, like in some ways, I feel like I can relate to Pope. Like just when, when people, when you feel like people aren't getting your grief, even, even when they're offering it to you, but you feel snubbed by it and you feel like they're, they don't get it. And if it were, if you, if they were in your shoes or the victim were, uh, you know, a loved one of them, like they would get it, but they don't. And you just want to like freak them out. You just want to make them, you want to deliver some dark and compelling content that just freaks them out. You want to put on a little show. Okay. And I think that's what Pope's doing. And I think there's part of his brain that's going, I, I wouldn't mind killing Tom. I wouldn't mind killing Hal. I wouldn't mind killing Anne. Like, you, you know, he's tapped into his rage right now, and he's taking it out on his, uh, you know, fellow humans. But I think there's a part of Pope, and I think it's a dominant part of him that's kind of in the back of his mind more. But he really doesn't want to kill anybody. He just wants some attention. And who could blame him? He deserves some. Well, and, and you you know what? You might be right. I mean, there, there's a couple of ways we can approach this. And I, here's what I think, now that you've said this. I think you might be right. I think when he said that to Anne about that's one approach, I think that he was trying to scare her. He wanted her to be scared and take it back to Tom and let Tom know, like, there is a, you're in trouble here. Right. You know? Um so, so kind of, it's like a warning shot. Like right. A so when he said, hey, that's an idea, that might have been where he did get the idea, you know what? I'm going to take Hal. I'm going to put real skin in the game and, and and let the chips fall. If it comes to the point that I kill him, then I kill him. I don't know if he's going into it thinking I am absolutely 100% killing him. And where's Anthony? Like, what? what is what is? I Anthony? think Anthony's gone. I think Anthony's off the deep end. He is, but what does he gain? Like, I can see where Pope gets some kind of satisfaction from scaring Anne, but why would Anthony want that? Like, because what is- he feels burned, he feels disrespected, um, he's angry. I'm telling you, he's angry about Denny. Yes. 
And I think that's what we're seeing play out. I think he is really snapped. We say that Pope broke bad. I think Anthony broke bad. Anthony broke bad. And see, now, it's funny because Anthony's hostility was always aimed at the skitters until it got out of control and he was using poor judgment. That's when Ann, Tom, and Weaver came, stepped in and said, we're taking you off the battlefield because you're emotionally compromised right now and you're, you're causing trouble. For, yep. for us all, you're, you're putting us all in danger, and for the good of everyone, including yourself, we're going to take your weapon, we're going to, you know, try and work with you, and I think Anthony felt put off by that, and so now he's almost lost sight of his rage for Denny and against the Skitters. Like, when was the last time he said anything about... The skitters. Like I mean, a few weeks ago he was, you know, beating yeah, no, his that anger skitter. is refocused on. Well, he was these... he was beating that skitter. Tom was looking on almost with approval, or at least with indifference. Yeah. And but now his focus has changed. He when was the last time he's even thought about the skitters or really even Denny that much? Now he's. I think it's become personal for him where it's like you. He feels not appreciated and he feels snubbed, and so now his. His war focus is on our protagonists. Yeah. And at the same time, do you blame him? At the same time, I feel like I can relate to Anthony. I feel like I get where he's coming from, and he's got some valid points. He's got some valid motivations. I don't, obviously, it's not the best judgment he's using, but at the same time, I think he deserves a fair trial in his, uh, in defense of his actions and thoughts. I don't know if we're going to get a fair trial. I have a feeling that whatever the resolution is to this season, Anthony's dead. Pope is potentially dead. And uh, no, I think I think I'm right. I think Pope's final act will be a redemption act. Uh, but hold I think on. I hold think, on a second here, though. And I don't talk about deserving a fair trial on the show, but I mean in our conversation. Oh, in our conversation. I okay. think that. Anthony's thoughts and actions deserve a fair hearing in that let's not just say like oh he's gone off the deep end he's crazy what the heck let's look at what he's doing and why and say okay would we react a heck of a lot differently or is there something to where who wouldn't snap after these people have been through everything they've been through yeah I mean I I'm of the mindset that he did snap as a result of everything that's gone on including the most obvious thing which is an alien invasion that changed the planet right you know i'm surprised more people haven't snapped and we've seen people we've seen people snap before like we've seen Anne snap we've seen lordis snap we've seen uh, matt snap you know but like we've never seen anyone snap this bad this hard for this long but i think this is the, the culmination of everything has finally done it to him I just think that, that I'm, I'm telling you, the weak choice is that it was the Denny thing that pushed it over the edge. And I think that was where, that's why we're having trouble gripping it. I think if we had had a little bit more of a slow burn to this, you know, maybe seen some, some signs earlier, uh, and then it happened, it might be like, you know, oh, wow, he was teetering on the edge. But this seems yeah. kind of quick. And it seems to be at least the catalyst was Denny's death. That's where he got weird and hit his PS. So speaking of, I'm just uh, ready to move on because I want to talk about another interpersonal drama that this we might saw. Be the thing I I loved. Go ahead. We saw Cochise and his father have Whoa. a few moments. Yes, and a, a very interesting look into the way Volm culture thinks. Yes. With the whole casual conversation of just, uh, oh, well, my, uh, you know, like my internal clock is r- running out. My biological clock is ticking, however he put it. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm ready to die now. So, bye, guys. It's been cool. Yeah, and interesting. Ever- this whole thing of him just, hey, w- my, uh, I'm expiring. This is it. Uh, he was, v- you know, unemotional about it. It reminded me of Spock. Uh, he reminded me of Spock more than once in this episode. Yes, I was thinking about that too because we've seen that side of them where they can be just kind of cold and calculating and not really very in tune emotionally the same way that humans are. But then you see them, you see that they do have 
some, I think what we called vulmanity back a yes. season or two, uh, where they do have, you know, it's not just complete uh, emo- er, emotionlessness. Right. It, there, there's something there, too. And I think we've seen that more with Cochise than with any of the other Volm, and that might just be because of he's cultivated the most deepest friendships and spent the most time with the humans. So I think some of that kind of rubbed off on him or maybe awoke in him some of that Volmanity. Well, yeah, we, we saw him cry at one point uh, when he was going under. A tear came out of his eye. Uh, he said, I love you. That was very cool. When he said, I love you all, I was like, oh. And, and he said, I think I understand this. I think I've changed, and I love you. And it was like, wow. Um, the dad, this was interesting, too, because the dad, you know, you want to say he's a jerk, but it is what they are. It's how they interact. We're saying a jerk because if, if you know, we acted that way, we'd be a jerk to us. That's not how they view it. Right. And and he, you know, how he is is how he is. But by having him basically giving the kidney to, to Cochise and expiring, and I also wonder something. When, when that happened, you know, they go into their state. They put themselves in whatever that state is. I wonder if he gave up at that point, if he was ready to pass on. He knew, look, I'm older. Now I have one kidney. Uh these are decisions and things that I need to step aside from. I wonder if there was an element of that. Yeah. And and the only reason I think that is because of that moment he had with Cochise at the end when they, they did their meditation. And I wonder if that was him saying goodbye. Like I, I allowed this. Well, and that's a, another big thing that I want to talk about next, but I just want to make sure we're covering everything in terms of, I want to ask, is it weird to you that this kind of came out in this episode, there, the Volm's thoughts on death, and, and Cochise's seeming surprise that it was disturbing to his friends that he was going to die? I thought that seemed a little strange coming up here this late, this far. Like, doesn't Cochise get by now that, like, death is kind of a big deal among human friends? Like, it seemed like he just he just treated it so well, casually. Maybe, like, yeah, maybe, hey, maybe guys, not. Uh, you know, I'm going to die today, so uh, bye. See, I think you're thinking of it as if he were human, though. I think that, yeah, he may think that they, they think it's a big deal, but but his culture is this, so he, he's like, yeah, I understand and respect what you guys think, but he also might be surprised that they don't understand his culture. Well, but see, he, he said something to the effect of, like, oh, I didn't realize this news would disturb you this much. Well, and, because uh, it's, it's so peaceful. It just seemed weird to me, and it, it seemed to come out of nowhere, too. Like, you, wait, you haven't been sick for weeks or months or years leading up to this? This just all happened, like, this morning? What? And what about that time in the uh, season? It was either season three or four. I, I'm pretty sure it was three, where he actually looked like he was injured to the point of what might be close to death. And then... Um, uh, let's see, he regenerated himself. Now, wasn't there a point where he was kind of like, oh, uh, just let me die, uh, you know, and then Anne or Tom was like, no, we're going to take care of you. But it didn't, I don't know, it felt weirder in this episode. Yeah, I mean, it, it might have been, it might be one of those things that, that they've wanted to do, and here we are in the final season, and they said, you know what, let's let's do this. Let's get, Let's give them a reason, because actually, I think this was a plot point more than anything. Uh, I think there were, you know, like a, yeah, a plot point, um, a plot device. There we go. I think that what the, the result of this is going to be is Cochise is now going to be in charge and it's going to change the Volm tactic somewhat. It's going to change how the fight goes. Okay. And I think that was done at this point for a reason. That's how we're going to see whatever's going to turn, whatever big things are going to happen. Now the Volm are going to be doing it a different way. Okay. I really do. I think that's what it was. I think the dad had to die to put Cochise in that position because the dad would never make the same decisions that Cochise will. Right. But did the dad do that intentionally, you're saying? Well, the dad might have. There is a question. Okay, so that brings, us that. To the, that brings us to the point of the, uh, what do they call it, the, the um, sharing of silence or something? Yes. 
Yes. That's not the right phrase, but it, they did that like meditation thing, as you put it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was between Cochise and Anne, and that was very interesting. The way the... I don't think that was a hallucination as much as it was It was a way... When, when Cochise saw his dad looking at Anne, and Anne saw Lexi... Yes. Cochise, I don't think that that was a hallucination as much as a way for the cinematography to tell us that they were both experiencing some closure right on, on some uh, right i don't think it was literal but m- maybe it was maybe they really did look and see that other person and the community there was communication between the two there is a chance that was going on um especially since we saw lexi change she turned into her before the transformation well it wasn't just before the transformation it was Lexi looking more like a normal girl because right. even before Lexi's transformation, um, she was still, you know, she had that like bright blonde hair that like wouldn't really have come from Anne or Tom. She had those like crazy looking eyes. Yeah. She looked more like a normal, like college student type girl. Now here, um, here's my other question. Anne's kid from before, was that, could that have been the kid from before? I thought it was a little kid that she lost. Yeah, Sammy. Yeah, uh, so that wasn't Sammy, right? No, that was definitely supposed to be Lexi, and I, and I'm guessing that it was Anne's way. And speaking of in terms of closure, that I'm not gonna remember Lexi as you know uh, this something white haired, yeah, as something yeah. freaky, as something hostile, as something dangerous. I'm gonna remember her as my sweet daughter, right? And I think so. I think that that they allowed themselves in that moment to experience a closure on uh, the loss of a loved one. And so that was a really beautiful moment, even if it was kind of pulled out of their butts for that this episode. Sure. It, 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 at the same time, they did a really compelling job with um, making this strange alien creature very relatable and very emotionally compelling. So um, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. I thought it was a great moment. And once again, since I was getting kind of that Spock vibe, I thought this was just a really cool way to handle all that. And you know I love Cochise, so right. uh, this was really, uh, this was just a great little moment for the series. And I, I love that we got more depth on Cochise and, and the Volm. Yes, yeah, we did. And um, so this is something, if we can get uh, Mr. Doug Jones on the horn again, would be a great topic to discuss with him if we want to bring this back up sure sure well we can try sure yeah that would be really cool so keep your keep your eye pods posted <laughs> right that sense didn't make any sense stay no tuned that's all right it's, it's after midnight so but stay t- stay tuned it doesn't even really mean anything and with no. today's technology so keep your ipods posted <laughs> anyway um what else do we need to talk about? We need to talk about something we kind of missed last episode, or we 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 uh, didn't bring it up. But this, uh, I forget the word, uh, but it, it's the creature that the skitters used to be before they were harnessed, and that has been apparently, well, according to Kochi, has been extinct for hundreds of years due to Esfenia's enslavement. But apparently, somehow, one of them or a collective group of them is somehow reaching out to Tom and that's what he's been seeing with these visions that aren't really memories, but they're, they're kind of utilizing memories that he's had where he sees his wife as, but, or his, 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 his former wife, Rebecca, right. he's seeing her and it, the communication of this creature will take place in the context of a conversation that Tom and, she had it one time. So it's this really was kind great of... when he, when he said, I don't remember this. And the thing right away said, that's not what this is anymore. You're right. This isn't the memory, yeah. but it'll, it'll put things, but it goes back when it'll put things in terms of like pre invasion family life. When she said like, Hal was supposed to be home from school by now. It's like, Oh, that was great. Didn't that was great. Out. Didn't, did you know what was going on right then? Right, I knew that Hal in in real life was being it, that creature was trying to warn him that Hal was uh, in danger, but it it didn't come right out and say like, "Whoa, hey, 
uh, Hal's being abducted by Pope, it, it like it put it in the context of a pre-invasion yes. conversation that Tom and Rebecca might have had. So it was very weird. It, it, there's still this kind of weirdness where, and, and what what exactly is the mode of communication here? I think there's something more to it than just simple, and I say simple, <laughs> quote unquote, simple telepathy. Uh, it's not just you know, one mind communicating with another. There's, no, there's something... something more going on here. Yeah. yeah well, you a... know what? I'll tell you one thing. We got a clue was when he said, uh, you know, that Cochise had said the Dornia are extinct. Ladonia. Ladonia. That's how, the... how are you doing this? And it avoided that. And it made it, it said something that made me think it's, it's cro- it's, it's communicating either like through across dimensions or across time. Something. Yes. And, and, I mean, that's a pretty big concept that I don't know if we're going to get real answers to, but wow, what a, what a cool thing. It would be absolutely insane if we did, but here's, and I'm not sure if we've really talked about interdimensionality on this podcast before, we might have, but what tipped me off was when it said something to the effect of, I can't exist in yes. your what was the quote exactly i can't exist physically in your physicality in your space whatever it said right that that's what tipped me off that like something is communicating to him from uh, another dimension somehow yes. this isn't something that's just that's the same point where i was thinking that too yeah, I thought, it's not just telepathy this is really cool this is interesting i hope i don't need them to like draw a big map and tell us this is exactly what's going on but I, I hope that they do explore it enough that we understand there's something out of our realm of reality. Right. And we've never really gotten too far off the ground, so to speak, in Falling Skies. It's always pretty much followed this group of people. And occasionally you've had experiences where, you know, Tom's gone onto a ship or, you've right. been, you know, they, they flew to the moon and back. There's been a couple little things. But they've never really gone too far off the ground in the sense of where they've, you know, gone to a different dimension or they went to a different planet and, you know, started walking around on planet, you know, Overlord. It's always been pretty much... Planet um, Overlord. Yeah. I always thought, like, how insane would it be if, like, at some point in a season, like, they just went to the, like, Ashveni planet or they went to, you know, whatever dimension is out there, like... What? It, how would that look? You know, what if things got really crazy? And at this point, I don't see things. Well, getting... That's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't see things getting too crazy. And if they tried to, I would be like, "What on? What off of Earth are you trying to do?" Because they're already, as we've already said, I think they're already trying to do too much in the episodes they have left. Bite off a little more than they can chew. We've only yeah. got six going into episodes. space and doing this whole. That's not going to work. We've us. got six episodes left to go, so let's take what we can play with. But I'm really interested in seeing. If there is some element of interdimensionality going on in this mode of communication, because it's definitely not, again, simple, quote unquote, telepathy. There's something right. there's something that has to do with it being embedded in Tom's mind, because there's no way for that alien force to be able to, uh, you know, pull out those memories and recollect those experiences without there being interdimensionality. And talking about I can't exist physically in your realm, you know, things like that. That's, that's, that's you know, textbook interdimensional talk. Yep. So I'm very interested to see how that goes. So um, any ideas, any theories about what this could be? Could could some of the... Uh, I, I think we just laid it out there. I think it's well, going to be interdimensional. And... Well, very broadly, but I'm trying to think of more specifically what exactly is taking place here. Could it be that some Ladonia had escaped the Ashveni uh, enslavement because they were able to translate into another dimension and, but they've been keeping tabs on this uh, dimension that they are from and now they're, well, they're able maybe, to reach out somehow. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe they are interdimensional beings and, you know, because Tom said, are you the threat? Well, to them we would be. Maybe it's even bigger than that. Maybe if if they're helping Tom and helping them figure out how to wipe out the Ashveni and they succeed at it, then these things show up and they really take over. Oh, you've seen, and, you've you fixed the 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 place. We can live here. You're all done. What excites me very much about this development in the story, this storyline, 
is that it kind of rounds things out and brings things back full circle. The fact that Ladonia are formerly uh, harness skitters, or they're, they're, they're skitters before the harness, before the uh, mutation. Yeah. yeah. So I find that very interesting because I was a little bit put off by the idea about like, oh, okay, we're going to have another alien race now, like first the Ashveni, then the Vuln, and now like another, and, and I mean, are they going to have a predator too? And is there going to be a predator of that predator? Like, you know, yeah, right. Know? But I like the fact that this is like something that we're already kind of familiar with. Like, Oh, okay. So this is what the skitters used to be. Very interesting. So I, I, I'm very excited about the fact that this is almost kind of full circle. We might see some kind of uh, redemption of the skitters that who are enslaved. And I mean, are skitters really any more, are they less innocent than a harnessed human. I mean, they're a harnessed creature that was enslaved against their will. Right, uh, it's an interesting thought. You know, what might we discover after all this time about what skitters really are, apart from the harness? Right. So, very interesting. I'm, I'm really interested to see where this storyline goes. We should have brought this up in the previous podcast, but uh, hey, here it's we are right. now. And, it's all right, here we are. I'm gonna I'm gonna just say that this probably is my is the most intriguing storyline to me so far this season. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna agree that and the fact that I, I, at least I think it's I guess fun's the wrong word, but the Pope story is I'm gonna say fun because it's exciting. There's something going on, man. Right, and Anthony, I think it's fun to see him too because Pope we're we're a little bit used to him kind of being extreme. Okay. But we're not used to Anthony being extreme. We're used to Anthony following orders. We're used to Anthony having integrity. Like this, this new Anthony is very different than any Anthony we've ever seen before. Whereas this Pope doesn't really surprise me. I mean, yeah, he's Pope on steroids. Yeah, he's he's doing his thing. This is something I might, you know, this doesn't surprise me. But but seeing Anthony act like this, it's very different from any Anthony we've seen before. So I think it's very fun, to use your word, to see, um, you know, what kind of maybe what the dark side of Anthony is capable of. Yeah, you know, I think you're digging the Anthony thing more than I am. Okay, so you don't like it? Uh, you know what, I, I don't know. It doesn't do much for me. The rest of it I'm finding a lot more interesting. There, I don't know. I don't know. It's I, I I maybe it's just because I'm so convinced that he's dead in the next couple episodes. I'm you not think, putting a lot of I'm not investing a lot in it. You think Anthony's going to die in the next episode or two? Yeah. Okay. He's not making it to the end. I think Pope will die in the last episode. I think Anthony goes either next or the following episode will be the end of Anthony. Okay. Now, here's a question for you. You've been saying for quite a while, I think since last season, that you could see Hal dying. Is this how Hal dies? No, because if if Pope kills Hal, then my whole theory is blown. Pope will not get redemption at the end. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, so, are, you, so are you so sure, though, that Pope doesn't kill Hal here, whether it's purposeful or maybe he got so close to it that it was you know kind of accidental like i meant no, to no. hurt him I, I meant to hurt him i meant to scare him but oh what but he that? doesn't he won't get his redemption in the audience's eyes if he kills hal well are you so but sure are you so sure though anthony that, has been hot-headed anthony could accidentally kill hal and then kill himself oh and that would be i mean we've been dark and that would be a way to end anthony uh to a degree, there's redemption because he'd be sympathetic. Then you go, wow, this guy was so messed up from all of this. He didn't mean to kill Hal. Here's the thing. But not, if they kill Hal, they can't hang around. We're not going to see that because we basically just saw that exact same thing with Brian. So it'd be like watching the same kind of scenario over again. Yeah, but this is this is a full-blown human. I know, but... And when we saw him do it to Brian, it wasn't accidental. He did it. He killed him. If he kills Hal, it could be accidental. Who are, who are you talking about? Anthony. Anthony didn't have anything to do with that. Brian it's killed his sister. It's so late. I thought that Anthony shot Brian. No. How did Brian die? Brian killed himself. Oh. 
Oh yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, oh yeah, I forgot that. He seemingly accidentally shot his sister and then turned the gun on himself. And then turned the gun on himself. So I'm but saying, you know what? if it Anthony did that same thing, I would say that would be schlocky writing to have that scenario play out like twice in like the span of four episodes. Yeah, but then again, they could be doing that to show that the humans aren't, you know, like it's just human condition or something. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. Now that you say that, I think that, but, but I. I yeah, I don't think that's going to be it. But I don't think that's how Hal goes. I think Hal goes in battle. Um, and then, and, and he might make it all the way to the end, or it might be an episode before the end. But I think Anthony, we, we got about two more episodes of Anthony, is my guess. But let me just finish this thought. Would it be so unthinkable that Hal uh, dies at the hands of Pope somehow in this coming episode? And then maybe we don't see Pope for a while. Maybe he escapes. Maybe he runs away. Maybe he's, maybe he's a coward. And then in the last episode, he pulls a Han Solo and somehow, you know, does something that saves everybody. Yeah, but can, can the audience... That's a hard sell for the audience, though. Because he killed, in cold blood, an innocent. What if Hal... And Pope have an epic fight, and it comes to a point where, like, they're fighting so hard that one of them is going to die, like, just almost even out of self-defense. I don't think we're going to be there. Okay. I, I just don't. I'm just saying I don't think it's unthinkable that Hal could die at the hands of Pope, and then Pope still have that redemption moment where he saves everybody. <sighs> I think it's unthinkable. I think Hal, uh, uh, Pope doesn't get his redemption if that happens. I think Pope goes off in the sunset as crazy. Or he kills Hal and Tom kills Pope. And that's how we end that. And you don't see that happening in the next episode or two? I, I think Pope makes it to the end and gets redeemed. And you think Hal makes it to the second to last episode, maybe? Kind of my guess. Okay. All right, it'll be interesting. And I'm not saying I'm sure of anything. I'm just saying let's keep our minds open because I, I could see some crazy stuff like that happening. Yeah, I mean, I could be wrong. I just kind of, this is how I'm seeing the, the chess game playing out. Chess game. I like the way you put that. Finally, uh, after three years, you like something I said. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew you could do it. So now my career with you is complete. <laughs> oh, thanks. All right, do we need to bring up anything else? I feel like there was something I was going to say, and now I'm forgetting it, and this is why I should take notes. I got nothing. <laughs> I gotta go to bed. That's where I'm at. I think we covered everything. I can't. I mean, really, the big shockers we we talked about at the beginning, and we've really kind of picked apart each thing that's happened after that. I am just really excited to see what happens next. And I we think are this excited. next episode is big. Uh, oh, by the way, do we know what it's called? Uh, let's see. Pope kills Hal. Oh, well, there they just put it all right out there. No, I'm kidding. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> Imagine if they like put the biggest reveal as the title of each episode. Pope, uh, yeah, Cochise lives. Uh, <laughs> Pope shaves his head. <laughs> this would be the worst. No, it'd be funny though to put if they actually each title of an episode was something that actually happens in the episode, but it leaves you wondering why on earth that would happen. <laughs> right, Before so you'd be you just see questioning it. it the whole time. Non-essential personnel. Mm. Those so, are the people, non-essential personnel are people who keep dying the most often. Yeah. Well, does that mean non-essential people are, are staying and the rest are going to Washington? Whatever it means, it means someone's going to die. <laughs> yeah, it sure just, does. Just the phrase non-essential means it just sounds to me like something's about to get sacrificed. <laughs> Yep. Well, and, and here, here's what we got. We got non-essential personnel. Then we have respite. Then we have everybody has their reasons. Then Stalag 14, Virginia. Interesting. Virginia. And then the last two, they have not revealed the names of. Interesting that we're talking about Virginia in connection with Washington, D.C. Correct. So, and Stalag 14, Virginia implies prisoners of war. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is going to be interesting stuff. Um, yeah. So next week, no, I'm just I'm still thinking about this non-essential personnel thing. I I really think next week is going to be a heavy 
um, battle episode. I think there's going to be a lot of fight scenes, especially given this last episode was very interpersonal, uh, yeah. very um, character development driven so i think we're going to see more fight scenes next episode and i think there's going to be more than one death i i think you're right i just don't know if it's going to be any of the big key players but yeah i think you're right well and it's funny that it, if it was because then i'm starting to really wonder what non-essential means <laughs> yeah, right so i guess we're going to find out we'd love to hear your theories comments concerns questions or tidbits uh, by means of contacting us through email or social media, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and, uh, well, our Facebook is nice and simple because it's just the name of the podcast, which is Second Mass Report, the Falling Skies Podcast, also on Twitter at Second Mass Pod, so uh, interact with us there, or if you really want to send us a paragraph or two, uh, shoot us an email. Rob, how can uh, how can someone email us? I uh, Send it to the main company. Send it to southgatemediagroup at gmail.com and I will see it and pass it on to Frank at that point. (laughs) The main company. Yeah. Uh, The uh, other thing is you could go to our website, which is www.southgatemediagroup.com. At the bottom of every page is a comment thing. You just fill in your information and send the comment and that actually goes to that same web address. Awesome. Love how I love media convergence. Um, speaking of which, we are also on Twitter as, uh, our own personalities. I'm at DJ Frank Stella or, uh, yeah, yeah. DJ Frank Stella. <laughs> I, I have, I have actually like several Twitter handles for yeah. several different projects. So it's hard to keep them all straight, but trust me, I'm aware. Uh, I know. I know you are self-aware. Yes. Uh, and I'm at our Southgate or the company is at SMG pods. God, I want to do that uh, Terminator podcast. And, and then we have, uh, we also have, uh, this show, which is second man's podcast. Wonderful. All right. So we will be back at it again next time for more fun filled discussions on falling skies. Uh, as always, uh, these episodes are airing on TNT Sunday nights, 9 p.m. Central Time. So keep up with that and keep up with us. The Second Mass Report, the Falling Skies podcast, is a production of the Southgate Media Group. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay active, and stay brave. <laughs>